before I could take another breath after I saw my supervisor. I just saw his eyes glazed over and the blood drained out of his face and he turned pale white and had this look of absolute terror on his face like we're not going to make it. One local story dominates our news tonight. Corpus Christi's public drain elevator exploded this afternoon at about 3 o'clock. The latest information we have is that three people are known dead, at least 25 more were injured, and some are still missing. They may be trapped inside the elevator building somewhere. The intense black smoke from the explosion literally turned day into night. The ground was going up and down a foot to two feet, and then cracking and popping so loud it's like it's going to split your head wide open. You just can't recreate the sound. It was shortly after three this afternoon when the elevator literally blew to pieces, sending debris hundreds of yards down navigation. I saw my supervisor go out of his chair to the floor. The wall blew out in my face, and the next thing I knew, I was going through the roof of the building. And at that point, I lost consciousness somewhere. Residents we talked with, who live around the grain elevator, told us the blast could be heard five miles away. And this is being called the worst explosion of its kind in history. The newspaper headlines the next day read that blood and bodies were scattered all over, that the parking lot looked like a battlefield. My body was broken over at my chest like you've been at the waist, and I had blood and cerebral spinal fluid oozing out of my ears, my nose, and my mouth, and I was in a pool of blood. They were going to leave me, and they ran out of ambulances and stretchers. At one point, one ambulance left the scene with a total of seven patients on board. Thanks to good Lord, one paramedic didn't want to leave me. He got another paramedic to help him, and they got me on a blown-off door and put me in the back of a station wagon, and that's the way I got to the ICU of Memorial Medical Center in Corpus Christi. So I don't remember the over 300 foot flight, but I do remember briefly waking up for just a little bit of time in the hospital. And there was doctors all around me and they were saying, I don't think he's gonna live. I remember thinking to myself that I'm gonna make it. I'm not gonna quit. You gotta rely on your faith and everything that you have to fight the best fight you can fight and never give up. Something that wasn't a primary Concern at the time when your life is on the line was the fact my spinal cord had been severed and I would be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of my life. That was a really depressing point in my life to be told I was never going to walk again. My son was born while I was in the hospital. I was thinking about the fun things I was going to do with him. It just kind of changes all that perspective when you've got a different kind of body you have to work with. That's why I got sent to the rehabilitation center to learn how to cope with life in a new way. I was an athlete, I love sports, so I played sports in junior high, high school, and on scholarship in college. You know, I didn't want to be paralyzed. My rugby friends that I had from Texas put me in the weight room and had me take the bench press bar off and it went down to my chest and they said, well, either push it up or we're going to leave you here with it on your chest. That was good motivation because I didn't want to be laying there for hours with that bench press bar on my chest. So I thought I'd better push it up and they threw the medicine ball at me like they wanted to take my head off. And then I'd try to throw it back to them to see if I could take their head off. That got to be a little bit of a motivator for me when you got somebody pushing you to be the best you can be. By accident, my brother, he saw wheelchair athletes running the Peachtree Road Race, and he invited me to come. 
I didn't ask any questions about it. I just went in my old hospital chair. It takes a good while of working on that to get really good. There's a real technique to it. It really feels more like you're just punching straight down. Well, in 84, they had the first wheelchair race in the Olympic Games in LA. There was a guy that ended up being a real good friend of mine, Randy Snow. And we actually trained a lot together, along with him and another guy from Beaumont, Greg Gibbons. They really woke me up to what you could do in a wheelchair. The very first one was Seoul, Korea in 1988. And my goal was just to bring back a medal from the games. But I brought home the bronze medal from the 88 Olympics. I went to the Pan American Games. I won four gold medals and one silver. In 1990 at the World Championships in Europe that I become the world's greatest wheelchair athlete. And the first World Games was in Australia in 1986 where I first won that title, best athlete in the world. I went to European Games in between those times I also went to Barcelona in 92, and that's where I was the world champ and world record holder. The better I got as a wheelchair athlete, and I started to get on TV a lot. I got calls from schools and sports teams, and other people in Texas to come speak to their school, to speak to their kids, to speak to the sports team. I guess they told me that a person in a wheelchair could never be, I'm one of the top 100 speakers in America. So I set a goal to do that and I made that. And then being appointed to the President's Council on Physical Fitness was a great honor by President George H.W. Bush because they only choose 20 people nationwide. Well, I was here at Kansas State visiting with President John Weefald and Vice President Bob Krause about the possibility of having the engineering students and professors help design a better chair for me to compete in the games in Barcelona. I think in America, we're gonna get some engineers together and design some new stuff that'll, that'll blow them away in Atlanta. You know, maybe some chairs that spin to throw the discus. How about that? <laughs> and from listening to me talk, they said, well, I sound a lot like the football coach. And they said, well, you need to meet our new football coach, fairly new, I guess, at the time. We met and he wanted me to talk to the team and I did that. And then he asked me back later during the season, didn't say anything about talking to the team. He just told me he wanted to show me something. He opened the door and we got inside. There was a whole room full of football players sitting in these desks looking right at us. And he said, you all know who's here with me. Kevin Saunders, I've talked about him. and You know about him, you know what he does. He's gonna tell you how you can go out there and win that football game. Kevin? So that was the start. And I guess I liked it because we won. It's always good if you can give a speech and then go out and win the game. <laughs> that was a really neat experience. And then he wanted to see if I would be a motivational coach for the team. What's stopping you? I really enjoy that. 
you don't need to get blown over the goalpost 300 feet through the air to figure out that you need to work harder. I don't want to see anybody have to go through that. You've got this chance now, you're here, you all have a champion within, and if you didn't, you wouldn't be here. Probably some of the most rewarding things is to see a kid that all of a sudden he gets it and he understands about what it really takes to be the best that he can be. That's probably really satisfying to know that kids that were on the verge of giving up or, you know, they just didn't get it. All of a sudden the light comes on and they get it and they go on to be very successful. I love talking to kids in schools, to the sports teams like the Kansas State football team, and then the corporations to reach their goals. People need motivation, I think, and if anything can lift their spirits and they can start to see things in a different light, a more positive light, they're going to improve the quality of their life. Happiness comes from your beliefs, from the way you live life, or joy. It's your internal beliefs and the way you live life is where you find joy. To find the champion within, you just have to maybe set goals that are a little higher than things you've done in the past and push past the limitations you currently have so you can reach new levels of excellence, achievement, and possibility. So you can accomplish things that you may have never thought you could. I think everybody's capable of it. It's the pushing that extra to get past that limitation that holds most people back. Once you see you can knock down one barrier, then you can knock down another and another and another and just keep going. I always say that in my books, that there's always a way, if you never give up, to write your own blueprint for success in life. Never stop being the very best you can do.